I think we're going to um, wait uh, just a few more seconds and get started. So if everybody would bear with us, um, we'll just get started. Barb, why don't you um, why don't you take it off of screen screen share just real briefly? Just bear with us for a second. We're having a few technical difficulties. Okay, Kathy, I think we'll just get started. Um, Good afternoon and welcome everyone to this great webinar. My name is Carrie Shannard Kunders. I am the executive director of the South Dakota Board of Pharmacy and I co-chair the NASCA Exec Education Committee. I'll be hosting this afternoon's webinar along with NASCA's Kathy Keough. Um, unfortunately, our normal uh, items that display um, across the screen, we're, we're not showing for you, um, but you can find everything on the website um, that you need as far as the upcoming uh, conference and other announcements, so, and also our sponsors. So um, today's webinar and all of our webinars uh, throughout the year, which have been fantastic, would not be possible without the generous support of our sponsors. So thank you to our sponsors. And again, thank you for taking time out of your day to join us for today's webinar, Controlled Substance Ma Management in Veterinary Medicine 101. So I'm really glad to have Barbara Hirsch here presenting to us today. I've always wondered how um, most of this is managed even my, in my own veterinary office. So Barb Hirsch, uh, please allow me to introduce her. Barb Hirsch is a highly competent professional specializing in controlled substance management within the veterinary industry. As the education and compliance manager at Cubex, she brings extensive knowledge and experience to her role. Barb is dedicated to promoting safe and responsible practices and serving as a valuable resource for veterinary professionals. Barb develops and delivers training programs offers, offering insights on effective controlled substance management in veterinary practices, as well as overseeing the first electronic PDMP submission platform for veterinary professionals. Wow, that's fantastic. I think we've all been wondering uh, when that might happen. Her ex expertise in regulations ensures practices maintain compliance while holding high standards of patient care. As a registered veterinary technician, Barbara understands the unique challenges faced by veterinary professionals. She collabor collaborates closely with practices, implementing tailored, secure handling processes to make, meet their specific needs. Join Barbara Hirsch as she shares her extensive knowledge and practical insights on controlled substance management in the veterinary office. 
Through our expertise, veterinary professionals can navigate the complexities of the industry, ensuring patient safety, compliance, and optimal practice efficiency. And of course, we all want our four-legged patients to be safe. So um, please join me in welcoming Barbara Hirsch. Uh, Barb, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you so much for that intro. I really appreciate it. Um, I do want to start off by thanking NASCA and Kathy for giving me the opportunity. I was able to speak at the conference this year, and I got a lot of really great feedback. I think my goal is to really educate people in the PDMP space about some of the challenges that we have in veterinary medicine. And the best way to do that is actually to introduce um, veterinary medicine. I think everybody is aware of the little mom and pop vet, vet hospital that you have in your neighborhood, but veterinary medicine is so much bigger than that. So I would like to talk a little bit about that. And then of course, move into talking about controlled drugs. Um, during the presentation, while I'm presenting my slideshow, I am gonna turn off my camera. For some reason, my system does not like me to present and also be on camera. And then at the end, when we take questions, I'll pop back on camera and answer questions. My presentation is about 40, 45 minutes, depending on how talkative I get. And then, so that should leave plenty of time for questions at the end. So one of the questions I get asked very often is, how did I get started in veterinary medicine? Um, a lot of people get started um, because they love animals or, you know, they rescued all the strays in their neighborhood growing up. Um, but for me, I, it's kind of silly. I'm going to date myself a little bit. But um, back in the early 90s, mid 90s, I would say there was a show on Animal Planet called Emergency Vets. And some of you may be familiar with it, but I was obsessed with that show. I just thought it was the greatest thing. It was essentially a reality show about the emergency veterinarians and the staff of Alameda East Veterinary Hospital in Denver, Colorado. Um, I was with at lunch with a friend one time and she, we were talking about the show because she likes it as well. And she mentioned that she had a friend that was about to graduate from a veterinary technology program. And I always knew that obviously there's vet schools, but I had no idea that veterinary technology was a thing. And, you know, long story short, I was enrolled and started the program within a month of that lunch with my friend. So um, I didn't do it because of the love of animals. I did it because of the love of a show, which of course morphed into just absolutely loving the veterinary industry in general. Um, because of my unique start in veterinary medicine, I've never worked in a general practice. So practices where they do vaccines and um, preventatives, flea and tick stuff, I've, I've never worked in a practice like that. I've only worked specialty, um, specifically emergency and surgery. Um, I also did teach veterinary technology at the school that I went to um, several years after graduating. Um, and that was a great way to solidify all the basic information um, my favorite topics to teach were genetics. Um, there's just some really fascinating genetic um, topics in the world of veterinary medicine. An example is calico cats. They're almost exclusively female. If you see a male calico cat, that is a unicorn in the veterinary world. So there's a lot of uh, really cool genetic stuff like that in veterinary medicine. And then uh, the other to topic that I love is... Um, terminology, medical terminology, which sounds weird, but I just love the idea that you could learn a language by learning the definition of different word pieces and then just opening it up to being able to um, decipher all kinds of, of medical journal, journals and, and medical information. So I, I found that to be quite fascinating. Um, okay, so let's get to the agenda. I am going to stop my video and then I'm gonna start screen sharing. Okay, I think I got that. All right, so let's look at the agenda. So what I wanna talk about today is um, obviously the types of veterinary medicine. There's a lot more than you probably um, are even aware of. Uh, we wanna talk about the controlled drugs in a veterinary practice in general. What does that look like? And then we'll talk about purchasing and the storage and record keeping. And then of course the administering and dispensing of controlled drugs in a veterinary setting. And then I will uh, talk a little bit about um, PMP reporting um, towards the end of the presentation. All right, so types of veterinary medicine. 
Um, I'm sure that many of you have had or currently have dogs and cats, rabbits, some of those basic pets that you see relatively frequently. And so these might be some of the practices that you had um, exposure to. So general practice, like I mentioned earlier, would be vaccines, spays and neuters, um, flea and tick preventatives, that kind of thing. Um, you may have been exposed to shelter medicine if you adopted your pet. Um, a lot of the, lo the larger shelters will also provide um, wellness visits the first year or so um, after adoption. Um, so you may have even gone there for veterinary care. And then of course, emergency medicine, um, you always have to mention, um, you know, the animal ate something it wasn't supposed to, got hit by a car, you know, fell off, fell off something. Uh, <laughs> there's a wide variety of emergency situations um, in veterinary medicine. Um, and just as a side note, so um, surgery, I was a surgical nurse for a very long time. And, and we do use the word nurse sometimes. Um, we use that nurse technician. Sometimes people don't always know what a technician is because you have HVAC technicians and electrical technicians, and then you've got a veterinary technician. And I don't need to change the oil in my dog, but when I go up to the front to talk to somebody and bring their dog in the back, I want to introduce myself as, hi, I'm going to be your pet's nurse, not your pet's technician, because people understand the, the nurturing and the caregiving side of nursing. So that's why we do use that term um, occasionally in veterinary medicine. Um, but I do get asked quite often, what is the most common thing that we surgically removed from the, the belly of animals? Um, and the number one thing we removed from dogs, hands down, ladies' panties. And the number one thing that we removed from kitties, hair ties. So if you have cats, keep the hair ties away from them because they play with them and then they'll swallow them and they'll get little bunches of them in their intestines. It's quite gnarly when you go in there and take care of them. Okay, so more types of veterinary medicine to talk about. Um, what about homestead animals? Oh, excuse me. Um, yeah, what about homestead animals like sheep and goats and chickens? Um, and of course, there's got to be some horse people in the audience. Um, I think the popularity of um, the, the family size homestead has become, it's just skyrocketed in, I would say, the last five to eight years. And so all of those animals need veterinary care as well. Um, so the first one we want to talk about is equine medicine. And, and generally, equine medicine, um, it does fall under the category of large animal medicine. However, we do tend to separate equine from other large animals because equine is such a different entity because there's so many different aspects to it. You could be a pet owner, you could be a ranch owner, you could be a barrel racer, you could work at the, um, the horse racing um, stalls and those kinds of things. So there's a lot of money in equine medicine, reproductive side of equine medicine is incredibly lucrative, lots and lots of medicine, uh, excuse me, lots and lots of dollars um, in that side. So we do tend to separate that from other large animal medicine. So when we do talk about large animal medicine, we're talking more about like donkeys, llamas, alpacas, those types of animals. And then we also have food animal medicine, you know, cows, pigs, chickens. And with food animals, we as veterinary professionals must know what medications can and cannot be given um, to these animals, as well as knowing what the quote unquote clean out period is. So if we give a medication to a food animal, if it's not safe for human consumption at some point, you know, some drugs will leave, uh, leave behind metabolites and other things. And so if you give certain medications to a food animal, they then can no longer be consumed by, um, by humans. And so we have to be very cognizant of, of those drugs and how they impact food animals, as well as the clean out, you know, from the time they stop taking that drug till the time they go to slaughter, that, that time frame is gonna be different for every drug given to a food animal. And then we have mobile medicine, and this really could be um, a wide variety of reasons um, why somebody would need um, a mobile veterinary practice. Um, so it could be because the animals are very rural. It could be because they're very large or non-ambulatory. Um, even like a hundred pound dog, if they are completely non-ambulatory, it's very difficult to get them into a car. And then an added complication would be if they happen to be in pain, they will lash out if, if you're trying to put them in the car and you hurt them. Not because they're mad, it's just 
that's the behavior of animals. And so we do have to be very careful in that um, situation. So mobile veterinarians will actually travel to the ranch or the house or whatever uh, the case may be and do their um, exam right there at, um, at the person's home. And then of course, just like before, I always mention emergency medicine. Um, I, I have to mention in every type of medicine because they're animals and just like little kids, they're always getting into something. So I'm going to always mention it. So that should pretty much cover all veterinary medicine, correct? Nope. There's all kinds of other medicine that we, um, that we are a part of. Um, the first one to talk about would be zoo medicine. So if you think about all of the animals that live in a zoo, um, the veterinary professional staff, as well as the husbandry staff, they all have to take care of the animals to make sure that they are safe, happy, and healthy. And you could probably understand how that could get quite complicated in a zoo, given that they've got amphibians and they've got reptiles and they've got mammals and they potentially have aquatic animals. Um, that does tend to fall more on the marine bi biology side, but not always. Um, so just the process of caring for all of those different species um, is a huge undertaking for a zoo. And then we have exotic medicine. And so this is usually your rep reptiles, amphibians, fish, um, you know, uh, those, the patients that are considered exotic patients, um, usually the problem um, is with the um, husbandry and nutrition. Usually their enclosures are not right, or their heat lamps are not set at the right temperature, or they're um, not getting a wide variety of a diet. And so it causes metabolism problems and things like that. Um, that's the most common thing that we'll see. Um, in those species. And then we have our veterinary universities. Um, in the United States, we have 32 universities and colleges in the U.S. that have veterinary uh, programs. And vet schools are a little bit unique in the vet space because many of them have a full-service licensed pharmacy on-site um, within the university. So in these situations, because they are licensed pharmacies, some of the reporting requirements are a little bit different um, than your standard vet practice. Um, so they would have to, they would have a little bit of a different set of rules. Um, I was very fortunate when I was teaching veterinary technology, I was teaching in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is not terribly far from the University of California, Davis, which is a vet school just outside of California. And we were able to take field trips. Each class was able to go on a sort of behind the scenes field trip to the vet hospital. And we saw some great things. Um, one time we went in there and um, they were anesthetizing a bald eagle who needed to have a wing repair. And the wingspan was a little over six feet. And to be that close to a, to a bird of all things that is that gigantic was so impressive and so cool to see. Um, the other thing that UC Davis, I don't know if they still have it, but they used to have a cow with a plexiglass insert surgically inserted, inserted in her side so that you could see her digestive system. So I'm sure a lot of you have heard, you know, cows have four stomachs and, and that's not actually true. They only have one stomach, but within that stomach, they have four chambers. And one of the chambers is called a rumen. And these animals are, call, are called ruminants. And it's this rumen that allows them to eat hay and grass and those kinds of things that we cannot digest. And so to be able to see that, the mechanism of that process live in a real animal was, was really cool. And the students really, really enjoyed that. Another aspect of veterinary medicine is the research and lab environment. So unfortunately, many of the products that, that um, we use are first tested on lab animals. And these animals also need to be cared for um, and make sure that they're safe and happy and healthy um, while they're in this environment. And then they also potentially get sedated or anesthetized uh, for procedures, which then would include um, the controlled substance piece. And then finally, um, just a list, which of course is by no means comprehensive, but it is a list of other specialties um, within veterinary medicine. And you would see potentially a wide variety of mixing and matching general practice and emergency and surgery and nutrition and all of these different things. So um, really you can Google it and find all kinds of practices, probably within your immediate area um, if you were to need a specialty of some kind. 
So I want to mention one more aspect of veterinary medicine that has gained quite a bit of popularity over the last several years, um, and that's alternative medicine. So alternative and complementary therapies can be really invaluable in the vet space, um, especially for any chronic issues. Um, when the alternative medicine is used in conjunction with traditional medicine, it can be incredibly effective. So looking at the pictures on your screen, the top left there, those are actually all herbals um, specifically for veterinary patients. Um, the lower one is actually acupuncture. And in my practice, we were a specialty practice and we did have a doctor um, who practiced both um, Chinese herbal medicine as well as acupuncture. And then on the right, that is an underwater uh, treadmill used for rehab, which is really great um, post knee surgery, hip surgery, elbow surgery, those kinds of things. Um, very, very effective um, in getting them back to being fully ambulatory. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the husbandry. Um, so husbandry is specifically a term used to identify um, the care of a group of animals. So if you're caring for a group of animals, you're providing them animal husbandry. Um, sorry, I just lost my place here. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so some of the basic husbandry requirements for a group of animals um, actually do require some special skills. Um, you know, nail trimming a dog, nail trimming a cat, that can be learned very easily. But there's some things that, that actually take a little bit more involved training. Um, so hoof trimming. So animals like sheep and goats do require regular hoof trimming. Of course, this depends on their environment, you know, out in the wild, they're on rocks and different in, um, different terrains, which will naturally wear down their hooves. But animals that are in um, like a homestead type of situation may not get as much movement on hard ground to ground down their, their hooves. So they do need to be trimmed. And it's just like trimming nails. Um, there's no nerves, um, but you do need to know what you're doing because you can do some serious damage. And then the lower picture is showing a horse being, um, getting um, its, uh, shoe redone. Um, most horses do get shooed, but you know, again, it depends on the environment and where they live. Um, how often that gets done is really dependent on their environment. And then of course, with birds, we have um, uh, wing trimming and talon trimming. Um, wing trimming, um, so wings themselves don't have nerves and, and usually don't have blood supply and that kind of thing. But birds do have a thing called a blood feather or they have blood feathers. And these feathers are very vascular. And if you don't know what you're doing and you do clip a blood feather, they will bleed fairly profusely and can actually bleed out um, pretty quickly. So you do want to make sure you know what you're doing when you're trimming uh, a bird's wings. And the reason we do that, mostly it's for pet birds because you, you want them to be able to fly, but you don't want them to be able to fly away. So we trim the wings so that they can only fly very short distances. Um, now this picture is a horse getting its teeth floated. Um, so it's called floating teeth. Um, so horses have a little bit of a unique um, anatomy in that they have constantly erupting teeth. So like you and I, we have our baby teeth, they grow, they fall out, and then we get our permanent teeth. And those are the teeth we have for the rest of our lives. Whereas horses, their teeth constantly erupt um, from, um, from their jaw. And so it's a, it's a lifetime thing. And if you've ever seen a horse chew, you know that they have a very specific chewing pattern. And those patterns can wear wear down their back teeth to where they get very sharp edges on the cheek side of their molars. And so they periodically have to have those sharp edges um, basically shaved down. Um, horses get this done from a very early age. So it's not something that is overly taxing to them. Um, they get used to it pretty quickly. Um, a lot of them do receive a small sedative. As you notice, the horse in this picture has their eyes closed. Um, and the guy with the drill, it's basically just a small file at the end of that drill where he is going in and just basically leveling off those back teeth. So clearly you would need um, some special training in order to be able to float teeth for a horse. And then finally, we have our horned animals. You know, sometimes these animals with curly horns 
those horns will curl and start to grow into their cheek, into their neck, into their eye. So it's something we have to keep an eye on and make sure that they stay trimmed um, so that they don't end up with open wounds. They also will trim the horns on animals that have, you know, the, the horns that stick up. And that's mostly um, for the safety of the other animals in the enclosure that they share. All right, so let's start talking about the controlled drugs. So most of the drugs on the screen um, should be familiar um, as we do use most of the same drugs in veterinary medicine as they do in human medicine. And while this list is not terribly long, what is not included is all the different strengths and sizes that are used. So for example, the phenobarbital injection um, injectable comes in two strengths and the tablets come in four different strengths. And then of course the tablets also come in 100, 500 and thousand count bottles. So um, because in veterinary medicine, you know, we can have patients that are, you know, a few grams all the way up to a 200 pound mastiff or you know, deer hounds, some of those animals get gigantic. So um, most veterinary hospitals do have to carry quite a wide variety of strengths of the medications that they, um, they carry. Um, there's a few exceptions and differences between human medicine and veterinary medicine as it relates to the drugs. Um, probably the most common difference is the fact that we do use multi-dose vials in veterinary medicine. So we don't um, and I and it's not never. I try to stay away from always and never, but um, we very rarely use like pre-filled syringes, um, single dose vials, things like that. We use the 10, 20, 50, 100 mil vials and dispense directly from the quote unquote pharmacy inside the hospital. It's not a licensed pharmacy, but it's an area within the hospital where all the medications are kept. Um, and then of course the controlled drugs, uh, the controlled drug lockbox is, is usually in the pharmacy as well. Um, commonly buprenorphine and methadone are used um, in human medicine to treat opioid dependency. In veterinary medicine, it's used for pain relief. Um, and um, for um, when you're learning something new, it is a lot easier for us to, um, to say, you know, when you're learning something new, it's easier if you have something to compare it to. So when we're in veterinary school, they always compare everything to human medicine. You know, if it's a disease, whether it's the physiology, the anatomy, we always compare it to human medicine because that's what we're familiar with. So that's why I use human medicine and veterinary medicine um, just to make the distinction. Um, another thing that's a little bit different um, in vet medicine is that it takes about 20 times the amount per pound of an opioid to have the desired effect in a dog than it does in human. Um, in, in a human. And so you, as you can imagine, it can create a dangerous situation if that dog goes home with an opioid of some kind and the owner has addiction issues, you know, 20 pound dog, 120 pound human, I could take one or two, no big deal. Well, that could actually be a very big deal. Um, so that's something that um, where I think PMP can really be helpful in the veterinary space. And then finally, um, a large distinction of veterinary medicine is the fact that we do have euthanasia solution, which allows for the humane ending of an animal's life. There's two main types of euthanasia solution. Both are injectable. Um, the regular euthanasia solution comes in a 100 mil vial, and it has a drug schedule of 3N. And then we also have, and I hate saying this out loud to people who are not in veterinary medicine, but the name of the drug is called Fatal Plus. And it's a 250 mil vial, and um, it is a drug schedule of two. Um, in the case of the euthanasia solution, because obviously of the potential danger, these drugs are very easily identifiable. Um, the regular euthanasia solution is a very thick, sticky, bright pink, transparent solution. And so if you see it in a syringe, it's, it's unmistakable. There isn't anything else like it. Um, and in the case of the Fatal Plus, it is a very striking um, dark royal blue color. So again, very easy to identify visually. And the only other thing I can think of that looks similar to that is chlorhexidine solution. If, you, if you've been exposed to that in the hospital, it's about the same color. It's thicker, but it's about the same color. Um, on a side, but related note uh, about some of the medications in veterinary medicine, um, 
for a medication to get approved for manufacture and sale in veterinary medicine, medicine it does require a certain amount of study, clinical trials, and, and that's very similar um, just like in human medicine. You know, they have to prove that this drug is, is safe and effective. Um, unfortunately, when the label says that you can give this to a dog, that means that they had did clinical trials on a dog. Um, but we might actually use that medication on a wide variety of species. Um, so um, not we cannot use every single species in, as part of a clinical trial because that would pretty much price the drug right out of the market for um, most veterinarians. So we do rely heavily on the education and experience of the individual DVMs working with these different species because off-label use of medications in veterinary medicine is very common, um, both controlled drugs and non-controlled drugs. Off-label use is very, very uh, common. So um, purchasing controlled drugs in a veterinary space. So it's kind of funny. A lot of people may not even recognize this form. Um, this is a DEA form 222. Totally old school for you guys, but it is not old school for veterinary medicine. Um, most uh, on the human healthcare side, most of the ordering, tracking, dispensing, et cetera, it's all automated. And unfortunately in veterinary medicine, most of it is not. Um, to order class two medications, um, this form must be filled out completely and it has to be 100% correct. Then the registrant signs the form, a copy is kept with the hospital and then the rest is sent via snail mail to the distributor. Um, and as long as that form is filled out perfectly, then the order gets filled and you receive the order along with the um, the receipt, so to speak, which is another page from the triplicate um, 222 form. Um, and you keep that with all of the controlled substance paperwork. Um, if the form is not filled out correctly, like they have some very specific rules, it's really kind of strange. But if it's not filled out 100% correct, they actually will just return the form to you without any kind of notification. You're expecting to receive your class two drugs and you actually just get the form back and you have to start all over. Um, there is an alternative to this form and it's called CSOS, which is the Controlled Substance Ordering System. And this does allow for secure ordering of C2 medications online. Um, the setup is very time consuming and there's a ton of paperwork, but it's very, very worth it if you have a hospital that has a lot of class two medications. You can imagine if you're using these um, paper forms, you know, if your DEA registrant goes on vacation, and in my case, my DEA registrant also spoke at different veterinary hospitals around the country, so he was gone quite a bit, and so, um, you know, you can't pre-sign the forms, and it's just, there's just a lot of complications using these forms, so the seesaw is definitely the way to go if you have the time to get it all set up. Um, the C3 through five medications are typically ordered via a veterinary distributor. So just like Medline, Cardinal Health, and Human Medicine, we have what we refer to as the big three. So we have MWI, Covetris, and Patterson, plus there's many smaller distributors and manufacturers that we use as well. Um, once a valid DEA license is on file with them, orders can be placed online or via phone. Unfortunately, when an order is placed, the DEA the DEA meds are not necessarily separated from the rest of the order. So if you place a big order for a lot of supplies, um, non-controlled medications, plus some of your three through fives, um, it would not be unusual to open up a box and see three vials of diazepam in a box with like bandage material and red rubber catheters. So we do have to be very diligent when we're ordering and receiving those things um, that they don't, you know, walk away. All right, so storing controlled drugs in a veterinary space, there's two main ways, and there's, there's variations of the two um, ways, but I will just give you the high level of the, the two main types of storage. So this one consists of a wall lock box, or uh, frequently I've seen a gun safe, you know, those safes that you just, you know, that weigh 600 pounds all by themselves. Um, I see that periodically. Um, the C2s have to be visibly separated from the three through fives. But as you can see, just 
just looking at this log box, I will tell you, gives me anxiety because anytime that somebody needs to go get a dose of a controlled medication for a patient, they get the key, they go over to this box, that box opens and ta-da, it's every controlled drug in the entire hospital. So it's, it's definitely not ideal, um, but I will tell you, this is um, the most common thing that we see outside of automated dispensing. And then of course, we also have manual drug log books. And so that's the picture on your screen there. AHA is the American Animal Hospital Association and their controlled drug log books are um, sort of the gold standard of what you wanna see in a controlled drug log, but it is a manual process. Everything has to be documented. Um, so the lock boxes obviously have to be kept locked at all times, but unfortunately, this is not always the case. I can't tell you how many times that, you know, I've gone into a hospital to do an evaluation. <laughs> There's the lockbox with the key dangling out of the door. Yes, it's closed, but, and it might even be locked, but the key is sitting right in it. Um, I've seen situations where the key is on a hook on the wall next to the box. I've seen um, the key dangling out of the the lockbox. I've seen them come in and unlock it in the morning and lock it at night. None of those things are DEA compliant, yet we do see that um, periodically just because they want to make it quote unquote easier for the staff. But obviously it opens a can of worms potentially if you have somebody that wants to do something naughty. So the other way that we see drugs being stored is automated dispensing. So that picture uh, right there, that is a QX cabinet. That's the company that I work for. We offer automated dispensing solutions. So some of you might be familiar with Pixis. Um, we use a lot of the same hardware as Pixis. We just have proprietary software that's specifically designed for um, the vet space. Um, so we do get the automated dispensing, that little circle on the top of that lid just above the lock, that's actually a bio ID reader. And so you'll put your fingerprint on there. And as soon as um, you put your fingerprint on and you're logged into the software, the software starts recording everything, every button push. It knows who you are based on your fingerprint. And then, you know, what patient you choose, what drug you choose, the doctor you select as the ordering doctor, all of that is recorded um, as you go through the process. So then um, you also get this single item access as shown in the picture. Now I can see all of the drugs that are in that drawer, but I cannot access any of the other, they're called QBs, but any of those little boxes, you actually can't open them uh, manually. Um, if you have to get into one of these little boxes manually, you actually have to break it and have it replaced. So it's not something you can sneakily go in and, and take something from another one of the other little boxes. It's not possible. Um, so single item access is obviously the ideal because you're not opening up this giant safe with every single controlled drug in the entire hospital. But the other nice thing is um, when I was talking about the manual process and we have those drug logs, every single controlled drug dispense or administration has to be recorded in those logs. And so you can imagine the amount of time that that adds to the overall process of giving controlled drugs to your patients. Um, and so by automating them, that takes away that whole manual piece. And that's a little snippet of the um, controlled drug log up there on the top right. And essentially it's great because you're not just, you don't have to decipher handwriting. You don't have to worry about people not doing the math correctly. Um, the system does all of that math for you. Um, it can be challenging if there is an extended power outage um, in hospitals that have these solutions, as well as having maybe not the greatest um, internet connection. Sometimes that can cause lags. It can um, cause, um, especially in the power outage, obviously manual access to these machines. We make it like a Chinese puzzle box and that's sort of by design. We don't want it to be easy, but in a power outage situation, um, it does become a little bit of a challenge. So we do encourage people to create specific SOPs for how you're going to deal with power outages, practice the manual access, you know, what does that look like? Because um, you don't want to get caught like, oh my gosh, I have to get into the system. And I know I have the, the instructions. I just don't know how to do it. I have not never practiced. And now I'm under um, pressure because there's some sort of emergent situation. Okay, so administering and dispensing the controlled drugs. So in veterinary, 
in veterinary medicine, everything is calculated by weight. Um, we don't do like neonate, pediatric, adult. We just have too many varieties because you could literally have, you know, a 20 pound baby depending on the, the animal, depending on the breed. Um, so we can't use those kind of designations. Um, so the vaccines and monthly flea and tick medications are pre-dosed, but everything else gets calculated. Um, most veterinary hospitals do attempt to carry all the meds their patients would possibly need based on the type of practice. Um, we try to create a one-stop shop environment so that pet owners can come to the vet hospital, get everything they need done for their pet all in one at one time, and then be able to leave with anything and everything they need, whether it's um, their monthly preventatives, if they need a prescription, if they're on, you know, antibiotics, whatever the case may be, we want them to be able to leave with everything that they need and not have to make an additional trip to CVS or Walgreens. Um, okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to calculate the dose. Um, the most common sort of way this happens is the doctor will say, hey, I need you to give two mgs per kg of this drug to this animal. And so then the technician will go and do that calculation, figure out what that volume is, draw it up, and then um, be able to give it. Um, after calculating the dose, they're going to gather their supplies. Um, if it's an injectable, they grab their syringe, they grab the needle, then they grab the other needle. So once they puncture the bottle, they change the needle so that it's fresh when they give it to the pet. Um, if their hospital requires them to label the syringes, they have to have all of that um, stuff gathered ahead of time um, just to be efficient about the process. And then, of course, we have to fill in the controlled drug log book completely. Then we'll draw up the dose or count out the tablets. And then we will either administer the medication there in the hospital, or we will give the owner the medication to go home and be administered at home. Um, administrations are logged on the animal's treatment sheet. So if any, if any medication is actually given in the hospital, um, it is recorded on what's called a treatment sheet, um, which basically gets to be part of the medical record. And then of course, dispenses are also recorded in um, the animal's medical record. All right, so let's start talking about some of the PMP stuff. Um, so reporting dispensed controlled drugs. So PMP reporting, as I already alluded to, alluded to earlier, is pretty tedious and time consuming for us because we don't have a lot of those automations that we have or that there are in the human healthcare side. Um, it requires gathering all the required information, entering it into the state's version of the ASAP, and then of course uploading it within the time frame um, required by each individual state. So what you're looking at on your screen is the first one is the practice management software. So the, the owner comes in with their pet and they check in at the front desk. And so the PIMS or the practice management software houses all of the patient information, all the client information, and of course the medical record. Um, but then of course, if you're sending home a controlled drug, you'll have um, additional information from your DEA log. And most veterinary hospitals without any kind of uh, PMP automation will have a spreadsheet of some kind, whether it's Excel or, or Google Docs, where they keep track of all of the dispenses. Now, I will say that some of the PIMS system in veterinary medicine are really great. You can run a report. You can say, I want to know all of the, the controlled substance dispenses between this date and this date, and it will print you out um, that list. Other practice management software systems, you can get a report like from this date to this date, everything that was sold, but it will not differentiate between controlled drugs, non-controlled drugs, supplies, services, all of those things. So really a lot of that time consuming piece is dependent on the PIMS that they happen to have in their hospital. When we were doing our research for QBEX DMP, our um, electronic uh, reporting platform, um, we did realize that most hospitals spend between four and six hours a week um, on all the PMP reporting. Obviously, this is going to be dependent on how many drugs they dispense, how many doctors they have, how busy they are. Are they are 24 hours, seven days a week? Are they only open nine to five, Monday through Friday, maybe half day on Saturday? Those kinds of things are all going to impact the amount of time that is spent on the PMP reporting. Um, unfortunately, because of this uh, manual process, 
it has caused many, many hospitals to decide to not dispense controlled drugs at all. They will just write a prescription. And while on the face of it, that doesn't really seem like that big of a deal, we do end up with two undesirable outcomes. And the first one is that the pet owner now has to make an additional stop. And, and as I alert alluded to earlier, we do like to be that one-stop shop. We don't want them to have to make an, another stop um, or potentially take their pet home and then have to go back out to the drugstore. Um, we'd like to avoid that. And then additionally, the hospital loses the revenue from that prescription. Um, and while controlled drugs themselves are not terribly expensive for the most part, there's a couple that are, but for the most part, they're not. But the management of them does make them expensive just from a labor perspective. All right, so what does PMP automation look like in veterinary medicine? Well, obviously, since we're the only automated platform, I can only tell you what it looks like from a QBEX PMP standpoint. And hopefully, you know, um, other, other processes will, um, other automations will be created for veterinary medicine just to make this overall process um, a little bit easier. Um, Okay, so we did develop automation, but the caveat for us is that you have to have one of our cabinets in order, and it has to have controlled drugs in it in order to take advantage of QBEX PMP. We are working on a standalone software only version, but right now they do have to have a QBEX cabinet, which clearly um, does limit the, the people that can take advantage of this automation. Um, so, the process is similar to before. The owner checks in at the front desk. And in the case of having QBEX cabinets, we have an integration with the PIMS partners. And so when that owner checks in the patient, then all the patient information then moves over to the cabinet. And then at the cabinet, the drug is then dispensed to that patient, to the doctor. So everything gets recorded. And then once that transaction is completed, because we identified that as a dispense versus an administration at the time of um, issuing something out of the cabinet, anything identified as dispensed is then sent to the QBEX PMP platform. And then those records, um, if they came over with all of the required information for that particular state, then that re um, record will automatically report to the state on the next reporting cycle. Now, QBEX PMP reports hourly around the clock. Um, if a record comes over maybe with a missing piece of information, so let's say that they forgot to enter in the owner's date of birth. And so in those cases, that record will sit on the PMP platform with a little red triangle indicating that it needs some attention. And as soon as somebody goes in and either corrects or enters in the information needed, they hit save, and now they don't have to do anything else. That record is complete and ready to report, and it will report on the next cycle. And then once everything is reported to the state, um, you do get confirmation on the QBEX PMP website with a little green check mark saying that that record was submitted. Um, you can you have access to all submissions. You can do it reports. You can look at individual records. You have the ability to go in and um, update a record. So for example, if um, a record gets sent to the state saying that somebody went home with 60 um, tablets of tramadol, and it turns out they actually only took home 10, somebody, you know, messed up, whatever the case may be, you can actually go in and do a quick copy of the reported record. You make the change, you hit save, and now that record will re-report and it will override the original. Um, just so that all the reporting is very accurate. So this process just makes just the management of the PMP records much, much easier. So what are some of the challenges? I, I know I've mentioned quite a few of the challenges that we have in veterinary medicine, but I like to just reiterate them. Um, so, but first, let me start off by saying that I am a big proponent of PMP reporting. I think um, our opioid crisis in this country is only getting worse, and I think these PMP programs are are helping. And I think having more and more veterinarians report is really going to um, only help in that situation. Um, Barb, I just wanted to um, let you know that. Um... We have a number of questions, so maybe if you could try to wrap it up in a few minutes so we can get to a couple of them, because we have quite a few. Perfect. Great. This is actually my last slide. Um, okay. So 
we already talked about it being a manual process. Um, we have, you know, one set of rules for veterinary reporting and everyone else. So if you're looking at a dispenser guide, you'll see the rules, but in some states, there's several asterisks throughout the whole thing because veterinarians have different rules and regulations. So just deciphering all of that can be challenging sometimes. Um, documentation that's not clear um, in the dispenser guide, like I mentioned earlier, they'll say we need the patient's date of birth. Well, in our world, the patient is the pet, but some states actually require the owner's date of birth and gender, not the pet's date of birth and gender. Um, so making sure that you are you are reporting on the right information. Um, we already talked about the number of labor hours required. Um, it can be difficult to isolate the controlled substance dispenses, like I mentioned earlier. Um, <laughs> collecting the owner's date of birth, sometimes they think you want their firstborn child. It's very strange. Um, so going through the, the process of explaining that whole thing is very difficult. Um, reporting within the required time frame can be a challenge sometimes. And then of course, making sure that you're keeping up with all of the regulation updates that can also be challenging um, as that information is only sent to the registrant, not necessarily the people that are doing the PMP reporting within the hospital. Okay, so this is a map of all of the um, states. The blue are the states that do require veterinarians to report. Um, so if there's any mistakes or you have any questions on any of these, um, my contact information is on the screen. Feel free to reach out. Um, the last time I presented, I did need to make a few changes, so I'm definitely open to any of that. Um, okay, so with that, we can open it up for questions. So why don't you take your screen off of screen share, I think. That's probably, okay. we'll, but in the meantime, we'll start with, I'll just randomly go through a couple of questions. Um, <clears throat> we tend to see many vet clinics where the veterinarian does not know the requirements of controlled substance record keeping, security, inventory, storage, etc. cetera. Um, I will personally attest to my previous vet had um, the label maker um, on the little drawers and it said <laughs> prescriptions. Um, so, and needles and syringes, that was the other one. So I can attest to that. Are these things being covered during didactic training or is there some other disconnect that can be addressed? I, honestly, I think in that particular situation, it has to do with um, the doctor and how they feel. You know, a lot of them, they open these practices and they just want to practice veterinary medicine the way that they want to practice veterinary medicine. They don't necessarily educate themselves on all of the DEA compliance um, and even just having business acumen of running a veterinary practice. Um, I, I too am very shocked. I run into people all the time. These are licensed professionals and they have no idea that their, you know, their hydromorphone is sitting right on the shelf right next to the diazepam. I mean, it's just, they just don't know. And so what we do at Cubex, obviously um, our sales team goes in and talks to them about getting our equipment, but more importantly, we do an assessment. That's the first thing we do is we assess what drugs do you carry? Um, who do you order them from? How do you order them? Where do you store them? What do you do when you have a controlled drug that is being dispensed, but the owner's not in the building yet? Do you make it up? And then what do you do with it? Um, so we go through all of that assessment first um, to make sure that they're currently DEA compliant before they start moving into the QX realm, because um, it is shocking how much that they don't know, unfortunately. Okay. And another question from Ashley. Um, if you were to see a veterinarian reporting buprenorphine sublingual films eight milligram, would that make sense? Is that used in veterinary medicine? Um, usually, like we have a drug called Cymbidol, which is a, a, a form of buprenorphine. It's great for cats because cats can't take anything. Um, if the drug is given to the pet in the hospital, then it's not reportable. But if we hand that drug to the owner and the owner is then going to give it to the pet, it has to be reported it's considered a dispense. So it really depends on how the hospital deals with those things. Um, sub, sublingual, um, long acting uh, medications, those are usually done in the hospital so that they go home and they have a few hours or a few days of relief depending on the drug. So, so would that make sense to have it sent home with a pet? 
sometimes it does. So um, a lot of uh, pain medications can be um, given PRN, so as needed, right? Um, so the doctor, and they may never give it, but they may give a small amount to give sublingual if they think their pet is, you know, in pain or, you know, experiencing some sort of discomfort, um, they will send it home with explicit instructions. And generally, if we send stuff like that home, we will draw up the medication in individual oral syringes and put them and package them and give them to the owner with very explicit um, instructions so that it we make it as easy as possible for them. Okay. And um, this is sort of from the same person. Who are the big three for vet meds again? Um, MWI, Covetris, and Patterson. Okay. And the related question, do the auto dispensers have temperature controls, temperature data logs? Oh, you mean like the, the automated cabinets that we have? So we have the regular um, dispensing cabinets. Um, the controlled drawers look a little bit different than the non-controlled um, dispensing. But then we have um, a piece of equipment called the Q-Lock. Um, and it's basically just a lock that we attach to a refrigerator and it's hardwired to the QBEX software so that it essentially turns a refrigerator into a QBEX cabinet. So in order to get into the refrigerator, they have to first go to the cabinet and tell it you're taking out some convenia or whatever you're taking out. Um, and the system knows that that drug lives in the refrigerator. So when you hit issue item, instead of a drawer popping open or a cabinet up, a popping open, the lock will unlock at the refrigerator. They'll take their dose and then they lock it up. Okay. All right. Just a few more questions. We're doing great on time. What kind of education, it's sort of related, but different. What kind of education is being provided to veterinarians on utilizing medications made for human consumption for the animal population? One medication in particular is gabapentin. A lot of veterinarians send prescriptions to retail pharmacies for liquid gabapentin, which has artificial sweeteners, which are dangerous for dogs. Yeah, and in fact, um, most veterinary hospitals that will prescribe that stuff out, if they are asking for a suspension or something like that, they very clearly on that prescription will write for animal patient or for pet patient or something like that, because things like xylitol and, and those kind of um, additives are very dangerous for animals. And so that sort of goes along with the same lines as we like to be that one-stop shop, not only for convenience, but we know what's in our hospital is safe for the animals. Um, and, you know, we don't necessarily know what brand or manufacturer that they have at the local Walgreens. So, um, you know, it can be a little bit nerve wracking um, with the oral stuff um, if they do have those additives in them. Okay, and one final question, um, just so that we sort of try to stay on time. Um, and thank you, it was very interesting. We get a lot of veterinarian practices who say they are unable to afford a system that automatically reports dis dispensations to the PMP. Is there something in the works to make these more affordable to veterinarians? Also, why does your current solution require a Cubex cabinet to have a reporting solution? Shouldn't the information be recorded into the PIMS system that directly reports to the PMP? What is the connection between the cabinet transaction and the PIMS? Yeah, so um, all the PIMS companies, um, some of them have like controlled substance reports that you can run, but most of them do not have anything built into their software to allow for that um, integration between the state and the hospital. Um, they just don't have them developed. It's not financially, it's not worth it for them. So that's part of the reason why we don't have a lot of that automation in that um, I do know that there's more PIMs coming online that are looking to do more of that, but it becomes complicated because you have the, the practice management software and there are very specific fields that it allows. Then there are the state requirements and those don't always jive. So a good example is the state of Michigan does require the driver's license when you're reporting to PMP. Most of the veterinary PIM systems don't have fields for driver's license. Um, and, you know, and some of that falls under HIPAA, you know, 
worried about, you know, the information that would be protected by HIPAA. Veterinarians are not, if there's not a HIPAA thing on the vet side. So um, a lot of the PIMS don't even want to deal with collecting information that might be considered a HIPAA um, violation. Okay. Um, sounds, sounds as if we could go on for quite some time <laughs> on this topic. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of questions. I'm yeah, so sorry. Do, I, if you want to send me the questions, I'm happy to reach out specifically and answer them. Okay. That sounds good. All right. Well, uh, with that, thank you to our speaker, Barbara Hirsch, for the very interesting presentation. And thanks, Kathy. This has been excellent education, as usual, for an ESCA membership on behalf of the National Association of State Controlled Substance Authorities. I would like to thank everyone who joined us for today's webinar. Again, thank you to our sponsors for making today's webinar possible. And we wish you a wonderful and productive rest of your day. Thank you. So one quick uh, announcement, because we had some issues with our rolling screen. We have another session that's scheduled on, um, quote, gas station heroin um, that's going to be held in... Um, uh, I think it's in March. So you'll be seeing something about that um, in the next, actually, I think I sent something out yesterday, a blast, but you can register online too. Awesome. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.